Well, good evening. I'm going to get this started, and then uh, right. we'll be expecting others uh, along the way. Uh, but this is our fourth meeting this year, and um, I want to make a few announcements before we get started. Uh, there's a leaflet out on our Ollie's uh, Winter Wonderland at Wolf Lake. That's on January 14th. And um, I'm you still soon. confirming some of the uh, speakers there. But uh, we'll have Dr. Troy uh, from uh, Purdue uh, Northwest. Almost at the time there. Um, and uh, Les uh, Marzalek, who will be talking on Native American artifacts. Um, and uh, we'll have a, actually a report on the research summit that we held in November 4th. And tonight we have a speaker from that event, Durs Anderson. On November 4th he was speaking about the BioBlitz. And tonight he'll change subject and we'll be speaking about uh, green ways and blue ways in the kind of that region. And uh, just kind of a little background on him, uh, not much, but um, he received his uh, degree from Notre Dame right, right. in um, is it landscape architect, it's just part of sort of architecture. And um, I've known him for probably more than 20 years. And I think one of the reasons I know him was that I used to uh, publish uh, a newsletter distributed to uh, passengers on the South Shore Line. And um, I believe it was his, the person that ran the elevator in his building would uh, take a copy of the newsletter and think and uh, pass it on to him. And I was writing uh, mostly about uh, the cultural and environmental history of, of the kind of region. And so that was the content of the newsletter. And uh, that to his interest, because he was working and has been working at uh, Open Lands, uh, not for profit group in Chicago for how many years? Uh, 22 years. For 22 years. So, and so for most of his career, he spent quite a bit of it in the kind of region. Um, so without further ado, we can uh, learn about his work, and um, here's Anderson. So I, you know, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, about open lands, uh, while we're getting this set up. Oh, uh, okay. yeah, go before you do that, Cynthia, I forgot to mention Cynthia. Cynthia is back in there with um, copies of her book, if you're um, interested in it. Uh, the last one is on Chicago and Western Indiana Railroad. Okay. No. And I forgot to mention that. Go ahead. Cynthia's books are great. <laughs> sure, you'll see them for writing this. She does a good job. Um, <clears throat> open Lands is a, we're a not for profit, we're an open space organization. Uh, we're about 52, 53 years old. Cover the Chicago metro region. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago, we got involved with NERPC, Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission, to, to work on different projects in Indiana. We uh, uh, cooperated with NERPC to, to do a, a Greenways and Blueways plan. Uh, greenways are basically linear open space, uh, corridors of open space. Blueways are water trails, canoeing and kayaking trails. So we were looking at Northwest Indiana and the whole river system and stream system to try to figure out which ones were really good for paddling. Um, <clears throat> Mish Barloga, uh, who was the planner at Nerpsey at the time, he, uh, he and I spent about three or four years together doing, doing the plan and then going out and implementing a lot of the blue wave system. Um, we never saw a paddler, we never saw canoeists out there. And uh, with, after the second year of trying to get local governments to put in access landings for canoes and kayaks. Uh, this guy, he showed up, Dan Plath, uh, <laughs> who a lot of you probably know. And, and you know, Dan was very plugged into the area, worked for a utility company, was a great paddler, and he decided to organize the Northwest Indiana Paddling Association. 
which was six or seven years ago now, and there were about 40, 50 people showed up in the first meeting. I think he has 200 to 300 members now. Amazing. People paddling all over Northwest Indiana, which has just been terrific. And Dad, Dad is a genius, you know, in setting up uh, canoe events. And so if you have a canoe, if you, you know, if you want to try it for the first time, uh, look up NWIPA on, on the web. And they have all kind of programs and uh, canoeing experiences. They, one of the most recent ones I know is along the Kankakee River when the sandhill cranes are migrating. They do a canoe ride uh, usually mid to late October. Uh, and you just see thousands of sandhill cranes <laughs> flying over while you're kayaking down the river. So. But they do uh, Lake Michigan uh, kayaking and Trail Creek, Little Calumet, uh, Grand Calumet River. So it's all awesome. So, so this presentation, I agree, going to be and, and what I really want to tie it into is, is the whole idea of health and what health is all about. So, okay. I think just the right arrow. There we go. Uh, and should we turn the lights down a little bit, or is it okay? It's right behind you. Yeah. How about that? So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the region, uh, the landscape of the region pre-settled before farmers came in and began to convert the land. Um, <clears throat> what's in dark blue was, was wetland, that's the Grand Kankakee Swamp. White, very light green was prairie. Uh, and then you can see the woodland uh, sections that are a little bit darker green. And then a lot of wetland along the Grand Calumet River. Uh, this, was a, this was a sustainable landscape. You know, if there was a, uh, a big impact to the landscape, let's say there's a huge flood that would have wiped out a lot of native plant species. Uh, let's say there was a meteorite that came down and knocked out a square mile, um, you know, a heavy frost, something that might have really affected the landscape. Well, the landscape was sustainable because the plant life would reseed itself, basically, and, and then just refill that area of stress and impact. And that's what, you know, we used to have was a sustainable landscape that was able to survive on its own, even though it got stressed out at times. Um, and what I want to compare it to is, is us, you know, the systems uh, that, that our bodies depend, that our life depends upon. We have a cardiovascular system that basically is, is a whole bunch of green waves, you know. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's our blood vessels, the red here being arteries, the blue being the capillaries, uh, and they're not showing blue on both sides and red on both sides, but we have a system inside of our body, very tiny capillaries that are feeding bigger, bigger vessels that then are feeding the aorta or the, you know, very large vessels that are bringing blood back to the heart. It's a system, right? uh, And, and this, you know, if we were to have an impact to one of those smaller tributaries, in, in the, you know, if we were to have an impact to one of those smaller tributaries, the, the body would cure itself. You know, it would, it would sustain itself over time, just like a natural landscape would. If we had an impact to the aorta, you know, or some part of the heart itself, you know, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to be sustainable. But we, you know, good doctors, I mean, we're able to come in there and cure a lot of the, the, the you know, traumatic events that happen to our body. So you can go from anything from a cut on your skin, you know, and that's, that's you're sustainable. You know, you're going to be cured, you're going to come back, you're going to be healthy, uh, a little bit different, you're going to depend on a doctor if it's a bigger part of your cardiovascular system. Um, and that's what makes us a healthy organism, just the way the landscape, you know, used to be a healthy organism, a very healthy organism. Um, we have other systems in our body. Um, so this, this is our neural system, you know, same concept. So when we're young, you know, we are a sustainable system. As we begin at 80, 90 years old, sustainability begins to drop. But, but we totally depend on this neural system to survive through our lifespan. Okay. Um, it's not a whole lot different than the root system of, of plants. You know, you've got the big root, you know, you've got all these smaller roots that are, you know, bringing in the, uh, <clears throat> that's coming out of the soil bacteria that's 
converting a lot of the minerals in the soil into the food that the plant needs, the different chemical compounds that go into the small root system, but then go to the bigger root system that then pops up out of the surface and you've got a living plant. Okay. And, and then, you know, if you look at the top of a tree, you know, we don't just have big trunks. You know, we don't have just 10-inch diameter limbs of trees. We've got all of this, you know, the entire system of small, smaller branches, twigs, and that tree would not live if it just had the big trunks. You know, it totally, again, depends on the system to absorb the sun's energy, convert carbohydrates, uh, you know, and then turn, turn itself into a living organism that is a system. Uh, and so, you know, let's talk about people a little bit. So, the, you know, these kids are in the system, and they're stressing out the tree a little bit. They're probably breaking a branch or two, breaking a twig. I think we all did that when we were younger, so we're stressing out, you know, we're stressing out this, this environmental organism, the tree, the system. But not to a degree where, you know, that tree's going to die. I mean, it, it will recreate a limb and a twig, it will regrow. And, <clears throat> If you were, however, to tell these kids, get out of that tree and don't go up there again, you know, go look at your computer screens for the next 20 years and sit, sit in the living room or the basement, then that, those kids aren't going to be very healthy. You know, they're not going to be very sustainable. Uh, you know, there's been some very well-known books that have been written really in, in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, Nature Deficit Disorder probably being the best known one. That if we, if we take ourselves out of nature, if we totally ignore nature as we're growing up, we begin to actually build up stresses, you know, in our system. Uh, it's, not, it's not our cardiovascular system, it maybe is some, somewhere within our neural system, but it's not healthy for us to be disconnected from nature. Um, we need nature. We, you know, there's all kind of medical studies now that have come out over the last 20 years. The kids that that don't go outside and live to some degree in a natural system, have more attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity. As you get older, if you don't go out and walk, and, you know, you're going to develop heart disease, you're going to develop obesity, uh, you're going to develop cardiovascular problems, you're going to develop diabetes. Um, so, you know, we are connected, we are part of this ecological system. And it's as important for us to be involved with it and part of it as, as what we call nature itself. Uh, we are part of that whole system. So, so what have we done with that original landscape that used to be here kind of pre-1830? So the Greenway system for Northeast Illinois, <coughs> you know, this, this would be the, the vision. That, you know, we've identified a whole bunch of corridors they connect all these isolated parcels. And it, it's going to take a hundred years, you know, at best to preserve all these corridors, but that would be the goal. Uh, a lot of these corridors have been preserved in the last 20 years. The first greenways plans were developed in the region in the early 90s. So already, you know, we're 20, 25 years down the pike, and there's hundreds of miles of greenways that have been set aside. Uh, either, you know, park districts, forest reserve districts, private property owners, land trusts, and so a lot has, has been protected. There's a long way to go. This system here has about 4,700 miles of greenways represented. The, the first greenways plan that came out in 1992 was about 2,000 miles. And so that, that wasn't, you know, enough. And as we kept moving to uh, the detail, I guess, in what we learned about uh, greenways. You know, we ended up creating a system that was adopted about 10 years ago by the Regional Planning Commission, Northeast Illinois, that has 4,700 miles. Okay. In Northwest Indiana, when we worked with NERPC, uh, these, these are the protected land holdings in Northwest Indiana. You know, the big, biggest one being the dunes. Uh, in LaPorte County, you've got the little bit. I'm kind of forgetting the name now, but the arsenal, the, the old army facility. Kingsbury? Uh, Kingsbury, thank you very much. Yeah. So those are the two big parcels. And then there, the, you know, you don't have forest reserve districts here that have uh, taxing powers that we have in Northeast Illinois. So you don't have as much land protected. 
But still, you know, you, you've got some really terrific landscapes, small parcels protected. Okay. And then <clears throat> when we did the Greenways plan, we did it a little bit differently than in Northeast Illinois, rather than just kind of <coughs> drawing thin lines. And we had open space corridors uh, connecting parcels. We looked at the soils in north, northwest Indiana, and we looked at the tree cover on the Valparaiso Moraine, uh, where you have a lot of oak hickory remnants that are isolated, you know, under the, you know, that whole continuous forest that's been split up over the last 100, 150 years. But if you're a bird, you know, and you see those old hickory remnants along the Valparaiso Moraine, there's a thousand plus acres of those old hickory remnants. And so, from a bird's eye point of view, it is, it is kind of a green way, even though it's split up. Now, that doesn't help if you're a turtle or a snake, you know, because you'll probably never make it from one to the other because you'll be crossing roads, you'll never get that far. But, <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, so, you know, let me point here. So the Valparaiso Moraine forest remnants are basically along here. Almost everything else on the map is the drained wetland soil. When the farmers came, you know, they basically ditched the wetlands or they put in tiles. They're still putting in tiles today. The dark area all along the bottom of the three counties is the Kankakee Swamp famous Kankakee Swamp that presidents used to fund that. And, uh, one of the most, I mean, it was like the Everglades, really, one of the richest places of biodiversity in the United States. And what you see, no, the, the bottom border is the Kankakee River. There's as much on the south side of the border as you're seeing on the north side of the river. So it was enormous. And it's, and it's all gone. Now, there's, there, there are about, I think, about 15 to 20 different farmers uh, that have worked with Ducks Unlimited, and they've restored wetlands within that original swamp uh, that represents several hundred acres. You know, and the county parks departments have bought land uh, along what used to be that swamp. So there, so there is a, a growing amount of acreage, and there is a lot of hunting down there, as you probably know. There's a, there's a lot of it. It's really important for bird migration. Okay. Um, this is a little bit closer shot. Uh, if you go down US 30, uh, this, this is the Deep River County Park. You know, US 30 kind of comes right across here. There's an old mill here. There's a candy shop over here. Uh, hmm. I think I remember every time I go down 30 before the park. But, but again, you know, that's, that's the disconnected system. Yeah. Okay. And then here's what the plan recommended. Now, <clears throat> This plan was not recommending that public agencies buy up, you know, all of these drained wetlands. I mean, these are all privately owned. And this was not intended to be an acquisition plan for public agencies. This was meant to identify you know, where private <coughs> property owners own the land, you know, that could be restored into wetlands. Uh, this would be, you know, ideal. We, we know that's not all going to be preserved because a lot of property owners wouldn't care about doing that. But if developers came in and bought 100 acres, you know, then the municipality would be in a position to say, well, you know, you can set aside this restored wetland within your development. Maybe it could be homes association property. It could be the back of lots. And so it still could be privately owned or semi-privately owned. But, but over time, we always take kind of this 100, 200-year perspective when we do these types of plans because this isn't going to happen in five or 10 years. This is, this is taking the long view. Uh, <clears throat> so if you were to zero in and come in closer, you know, on just one part of, uh, this would be in Porter County. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing to think about too, you know, when we, and this is, a, this is up in uh, DeKalb County, I'm not showing the wetland soils here at all, <clears throat> but what I'm showing, the farmers, uh, they, if it was a large wetland, they would just put a ditch through it, you know, and that would, the water would begin to drain out of the soils. It would make a lot of the soils tillable. If it didn't make all the soils tillable, you know, then they put in tiles, and then the tiles would drain the rest of that wetland into the ditch that they had carved through. So <clears throat> the, most of these creeks in here you know, weren't here pre-1830. This would have probably been just a large wetland swale 
that came th through here in a wet way and soiled here, and maybe the water might have been dribbling out at this end of it and then finally going into a creek. So <clears throat> the reality is the landscape we have today, because of its large agricultural landscape, is we have thousands of miles of these, these small creeks. These are called headwater streams. Um, they're terrific habitat. You know, we basically created an incredible habitat in our landscape that didn't exist before. And it ain't going away. You know, in most cases, you know, even though the ideal would be to restore all this wetland, you know, maybe we might get there in a couple hundred years. But in the meantime, we're going to have a creek, a headwater creek that's fed by tiles. It's getting very cold groundwater underneath of the corn and discharging into the creek. And when you have a cold water creek that has some type of habitat structure, you've got really good habitat for, for biodiversity, for fish and macroinvertebrates. As long as the farmer is not dumping too, too many agricultural chemicals into that creek. And farmers are usually excellent, you know, at managing their chemicals. Uh, chemicals are expensive when you're putting them on 500 acres, and they're not about to put chemicals out, herbicides or pesticides out there if there's a storm coming, because it'll get washed into the creek and they're going to have to do it over again. When you have residential subdivisions and everybody, you know, is going to Ace Hardware and buying Roundup and just spraying it on, their, you know, homeowners are the worst, is my point, by far. So when you have a rainstorm coming on a residential subdivision, that's, that's where we get a lot of chemical runoff. So what we're finding as we explore these creeks that they're really good habitat. There's a lot of biodiversity, and they're just not inventory. Nobody's been paying attention to them. So we have this headwater stream landscape all over southeast Wisconsin, northeast Illinois, northwest Indiana, that really nobody's been paying attention to because we we don't have the people and the uh, professors and the aquatic biologists that work for state agencies that can go and visit what we estimate to be about 3,000 of these first order. And then when two first order creeks come together, this is a second order. So these, you know, this first first and second, these are considered headwater creeks. So all of the yellow in here is the land that's draining to these first order and second, only to the first order creeks, not even the second order. So you can see that most of our landscape, you know, really it goes to these first order creeks. When you get to a second order creek, or when you get to the bigger river, which is usually a third order, and when third order, third order come together, then that's a fourth order, and then that's going to flow into the Rock River, which will be the fifth order, which will flow into Illinois, which will be sixth. By the time it's in Mississippi, it's the seventh order, and you've got, you know, you got these huge rivers. But these tiny little creeks are really, really important habitat. So, you know, we uh, in open lands, we uh, since nobody, I mean, the environmental agencies, the forest preserve districts, you know, the agencies yeah, haven't been paying attention to these creeks, and we've been working for the last three or four years to raise their visibility. Uh, we're in the middle of writing a report for Chicago Wilderness that covers, you know, the Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana area, the in metro region, uh, to, to try to elevate the importance of these headwater creeks and get people excited about them. The neat thing about them, too, is, is they're usually just six inches to a foot deep. You know, so kids can go into those creeks and they can, they can explore, they can pull up trained fly larvae, you can try to find mussels, you can try to net fish. You know, they're, they're a habitat that's human scale, whereas you're not going to let, you know, a six-year-old kid go into a big river. But we've got these all over the region and we haven't been paying attention to them. And so we're trying, like I say, trying to raise this building. That's a rainbow dart on, on the bottom. And, I'm forgetting the turtle, uh, threatened species of a turtle on the left that they discovered at the site here. Okay. Um, and so here, you know, we get into uh, a, a third order part of the river system. And that, as you go into the, the bigger rivers, you know, they're going to be good quality if they have really good headwaters. And so it's just like the capillaries, it's just like the little neural connections in our bodies. If you want, all of those deteriorate, you know, your, your main 
connections within your, your main systems in your body are going to deteriorate, and you're just not going to survive. <coughs> so as a system, you know, these head level creeks are incredibly important. In this case, this is the Kishwaukee River, which is a really high quality river, and we're doing muscle surveys in here. Uh, this was on a 100 degree day, which I, I love going into rivers on 100 degree days. It's Roger Plosek, an aquatic biologist, a forest reserve staff person. And we basically just, you know, crawl into the river and push our hands through the bottom until we bump in the mussels, you know, and we pull them out, put them in bags, and identify them. Then the mussels indicate, you know, how healthy that biodiversity, how healthy that river is. So th this is Liz McCluskey. Uh, she, she is part owner of, of a, about a 30-acre parcel that's over by the Purdue campus uh, in, in Porter County. This is just a couple weeks ago, and the uh, Isaac Walton League is buying this property, uh, I, I believe from her and a neighbor. Um, and so she was showing me her headwater stream, and it's, it's a great headwater stream. She's still with the she, yeah, she used to be with me as well. I don't know if she's retired or I, I believe she might be retired. This is a little bit more downstream. This is the Calumet River system. You know, I mean, this is a headwater of the Calumet River. So, you know, as much as we talk about how the Calumet River's deteriorated, it's really because of the pollution that, that we've been putting in the river in the main part of the river. So you go up into the headwaters, first and second order streams, and it's just terrific habitat. So if you take the long view again, you know, so let's say 100 years or so, the Calumet River could be like the Kishwaukee, <clears throat> believe it or not, you know. I mean, you, that river can come back and be incredibly biodiverse, could have all kind of great sports fish in there that don't have chemicals in the fish tissue. You know, so that's the goal, that we get the Calumet River back into a river system that's, that's really high quality. And that's not a 10 or 20 year goal. You know, that's a hundred year old and more. But we start at these tributaries. As long as we can protect these headwater streams, the Calumet River's got a fighting chance. But if we let these fall apart and deteriorate, you know, we'll never bring the Calumet River back. So that's why they're so important. Okay. And, and in the, uh, this is the creek that Liz's uh, property includes is called Reynolds Creek. Um, Reynolds Creek is the only creek in the entire Calumet River system, Illinois and Indiana, that has modeled sculpins. And modeled sculpins are, are really important fish, very rare. Um, we see them in the, in the Kankakee River Basin and they're uh, to fair, you know, fair degree, uh, and also in Trail Creek, but nowhere else in the whole Calumet River system except Reynolds Creek. And they're all over Reynolds Creek. I mean, almost every, every little headwater you go into in Reynolds Creek model skeletons are popping up. So they're, they're holding on. You know, they probably were all over the Kelly River system 100, 150 years ago. But these are the critters that, you know, because they're surviving in Reynolds Creek, we can transplant them. It takes special permits, but you can transplant them into other creek systems. And so over time, you know, with all the headwaters of the Kelly River, we could get these fish popping up all over as long as we know, number one, it's, cold, it's gotta be cold water, because they're cold water fish. So we've gotta protect the stream corridor. We have to have private property owners who care about that. But, uh, but that's, that was important to discover a model skull. Probably one of the ugliest, strangest looking fish. I, I've gotta get a head on view of it because he'll jump back, you know, when I put the slide up. But they're, uh, they're, they're just, they're neat. And, and, you know, one of the things we have to do with new development is avoid doing these impoundments on the creek. You know, where there's a dam at the far left end and a culvert, you know, going through the dam. Because then the fish can't move up and down the stream. In a headwater creek, and, you know, winter goes 10, 15 degrees below zero and that headwater creek freezes solid. You know, the fish are moving downstream trying to stay in the habitat where they'll survive. Um, and if you, they can't make it through a culvert, they can't jump a foot. Or, you know, they, so you, we've got to have a continual system. They're also a fish that is not going to swim through a warm lake or a warm pond, you know, because they're a cold water fish. So, so we've got to, when we do future developments, so this is where, you know, 
when we identify the importance of these streams and we work with municipalities and give them guidelines to help sustain these streams, these are things we'll talk about is, you know, go ahead, you know, development is fine, but, you know, don't impound a creek, keep that creek uh, at a creek. You can do an impoundment on the side of the creek as a separate lake. You know, you can feed that separate pond or lake with flood water coming from the creek. And there's ways of doing it, but just don't dam up the creek itself. And, and so, so that's nice, you know, out in the rural kind of subdivision area. But, you know, I mean, here's the Chicago River, uh, South Branch of the Chicago River in Chicago. It's like, okay, right, are we ever going to restore this? Is this ever going to be a good river again? Um, Chicago was a large swamp land, you know, so there probably were all kind of little headwater streams coming out of the swamps, finally getting to the Chicago River. And so that's a landscape that, you know, again, Take the 100, 200 year view, you know, we, so what? You know, we, we restore it. You know, we know how to do it. Uh, go ahead, Mike. This was, this was an architecture class at the University of Illinois. It's the same, that's the same river. That's what could be done over time. And that's what some developers along the Chicago River actually are doing. You know, they're, they're doing uh, places where, where you can infiltrate <coughs> storm water, you know, into, into these wetlands with, where the plants remediate, phytoremediate a lot of the pollutants before then the water goes into the river system. So that's what most of these, you know, little blocky areas are, 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 are mitigation sites where we're cleaning up the storm water, which is the key to cleaning up the Chicago River. But you don't just say, you know, people aren't allowed there. I mean, you design, you know, in the city, in a large urban area, you design this so people can come down there and enjoy it. And look, look at, you know, the different dragonflies that suddenly are living there again, or butterflies, or small fish that might be in a, in a small pond. And so you get people back involved with nature again, because we, we need each other to be healthy, to go back to that earlier point. <coughs> So this is, this is Indian Creek uh, in the Hedwish neighborhood. This is the Ford Industrial Supplier Park, uh, Calumet River. This is one of the restorations that was done. The Center Point, the development company that built the Ford Industrial Supplier Park. Uh, Suzanne Malik, who was the uh, head of the Department of Environment for the city of Chicago. Uh, required, well, and, well it's, it's actually a more interesting story than that. We, we were so, Suzanne was leading a negotiating team, and, and I was one of the advisors on this team. Center Point just didn't want to do anything in terms of restoration of the landscape. And, and Suzanne kept pushing them, to, you know, and, but they were saying, well, you know, we're going to create hundreds of jobs here, and we got to move, and we got to get decisions made quick, and you're slowing us down. And <clears throat> somebody made a call to Ford in Detroit. <laughs> At the River Rouge, at the River Rouge plant, which was designed, uh, redeveloped, much of it was redeveloped by a famous architect that's a sustainable landscape architect who did all kinds of things at the River Rouge plant to clean up the storm water that was flowing off this hundred year old industrial property. And, and some complaint came in to Ford, and Ford ended up calling Center Point and said, Listen, Suzanne, do what she wants to do. Uh, that's the story I've heard. And so what happened with Indian Creek is they recreated, it's tough to see in the slide, but they recreated a meandering creek, put in a whole wetland restoration. This is a bird, great bird observation point. And then uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of rock riffles up here where the creek uh, cascades <coughs> down in the Calumet River. So Indian Creek is only about a mile long, but this, this part of the creek has been restored. You know, now we're focused on getting the rest of the creek restored as it comes over to Wolf Lake. Um, <clears throat> so here's here's the area I was just talking about where the restoration occurred, including this wetland in here. Uh, this is owned uh, by the uh, Edwish or Southeast Sportsman's Club, Sports Facility Coalition. They, they run a couple ball fields in here. And the creek's in pretty decent shape. It just needs some uh, some management. Um, and then uh, this this is Hyde Lake. And my understanding was Alderwoman Garza, uh, Sandalowski Garza, uh, is going to do a creek restoration project here with a bunch of 
of union workers uh, in April and May uh, in the creek from this point over to 126th Street, removing invasive vegetation, you know, taking the garbage and debris and cans out of the creek. This is the Shroud Industrial Property. This is heavy pollution. It's an uncapped brownfield. There's all kind of bad chemicals flowing into the creek because of the storm water that infiltrates in here. Uh, this is a problem that we've been working on, and Mike knows this very well. <laughs> Uh, but over time, sooner or later, some responsible government agency or non for profit will get this property. There's all kind of money available from the US EPA to do the capping and restoration and stream recreation, but we've got to get ownership of the property from the owner. Durs, does the, does the water flow out of Wolf Lake? Yeah, it into goes this way into the Kelly Does it's, that flow west to the Kankakee in Illinois, or does it flow east into Lake Michigan? The Calico River itself? Yeah. Yeah, well, at this point, it's, it it's flow. flowing into Lake Michigan. Oh, yeah. Lake Michigan it doesn't flow yeah. a lot. And then, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, if you're south of the O'Brien Lock, it goes into the Calsat Canal and to the Illinois River. Okay. Yeah. And so it's not connected with uh -huh. uh, but, but it's But this is a first order creek. You know, this is, we, it's, it's a weird one. It's really strange, but this is the first order creek that's coming out of a large body of water. That's being fed by the industrial facility at the North End that's taking cooling water from Lake Michigan. You know, and after cooling its facility, its, it's, it's uh, industrial facility, you know, then discharges into the lake. So it's real clean water. And then it doesn't become a creek until this point. So this is actually a first order creek, one of the strangest ones in the whole metropolitan region. Um, but you know, there's, there's been at least one sighting of a lake sturgeon, you know, that has come up here. There's no reason they shouldn't be coming up here. Um, there's all kinds of salmonids, you know, that, uh, I'm not a fisherman, so, uh, like, like white salmon or uh, white yeah. trout. Yeah. yeah, so they see the big uh, sports fish coming up that river getting, getting into the lake. Uh, so it's, it wants to be a good, healthy river. It's trying really hard right now. Uh, if we ever got hold of that one brownfield and cleaned it up, it, it would be a terrific little creek system. The issue going on right now is, is like Kelly met. We're working really hard um, to acquire a bunch of property from the Port Authority uh, at the north end of Lake Kelly met. We're trying to buy this peninsula. We're trying to acquire this peninsula here, all of this lakeshore habitat, and what is called square marsh up here. <clears throat> uh, all of these properties are on the city land use plan the mayor, under Mayor Daly's administration, the city adopted. Uh, that was 2002. Uh, Forest Preserve District tried to buy this from the Port Authority. They never answered the phone. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources cut a deal uh, two years ago for seven and a half million dollars to buy this peninsula and Square Marsh. And then Governor Rauner was elected and they backed out of the deal. So for the third time now, what we're doing is we've organized, um, uh, and Tom, <laughs> especially representing the community, uh, an effort, you know, where we're meeting with the Port Authority and we're hoping to raise monies through not through the foundations and governmental grants. Um, and then the, uh, the hope is that the Chicago Park District or the Forest Preserve District would be able to <coughs> take ownership of the property, both of whom have told us that, you know, we'd be willing to take it, we just don't have the money to buy it. And so we're negotiating a price, uh, and we'll see if that happens in the next three to six months. Uh, Congresswoman Kelly uh, has been really supportive uh, of this effort, and Alderwoman uh, Garza has been very supportive of it. Congressman Quigley, you know, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. The fear is they've hired a new executive director. He's very aggressive. Um, he's been there less than a year, and he's out there trying to market the property. So if you go on Port Authority website, you know, you'll know you see this parcel. This is where there was an eagle's nest for several years. It's all wooded. This property, you know, they're advertising for lease. You know, they, they lease this a week from now if they had a good offer on it. So we're trying to, to move in quickly because 
and, and we're also really concerned this, this might go as well. This wetland up here was supposed to be a hemi marsh, which is about 50% emergent vegetation and 50% water and wetland birds love that habitat. But the Port Authority needs to drain it and reflood it and drain it and reflood it. They've never done that in the 20 years it's been there. So the Audubon uh, group is really interested in this. The Park District is going to be managing any marsh right here, a big marsh. So they, they could be an obvious manager. There, there's a culvert right here where we can put in a water control structure. So, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. So I should move faster here, I think. <laughs> So, so one of the other issues with Lake Calumet is that where's the water coming from? This isn't like Wolf Lake, where we're getting fresh Lake Michigan water all the time. And we want this water quality to be decent too. So I, I just, I've never had the time to trace it out, but today, I, for the first time, I tried to trace out where I was seeing water, you know, continuously flowing through a creek. So this is Van Blessington Prairie, or Marion Burns Natural Area, Norfolk and Southern Marsh, uh, this is Big Marsh, um, and so there, there is a continuous flow of water, more or less, coming through here. Big Marsh, when it gets restored to a certain degree, will be fight over mediating and cleaning that water to some degree. Uh, Norfolk and Southern Marsh is doing it already. It's all giant reed and fragmites, but that, that cleans the water. Uh, most recent aerial photograph shows that the railroads have just filled all this in, which was illegal. So we'll be telling our report engineers about that. Uh, this was all put in a wetland, and uh, it's going to be very expensive for that railroad to pay the fines and fees for doing that. There's also drainage coming through here that goes into Square Marsh. If we get that to the Heavy Marsh, that'll fight over mediate a lot of the pollutants. Uh, there's, there's a ditch on the east side of the Bishop Ford, and then there's um, David Doig's development where he's got the Walmart and uh, the Method Soap Factory and all that on the <coughs> north side of Pullman, on the west side of Bishop Ford. Uh, David has done all kind of wetland uh, infiltration, you know, good best management practices. So this used to be a big brown field, and now the water running off of it is going to be really pretty clean, storm water running off of it. The problem, though, is that the Bishop Ford is still here, and that has a lot of pollutants. And so even though, you know, this, this is going to be pretty clean as the water goes under the Bishop Ford into a pumping station, the Bishop Ford's going to add a lot of pollutants still, and then the water comes into the lake this way. So, th so these are issues, again, you know, to solve it. I mean, we don't have to solve it today or tomorrow. I mean, let's solve it in five years or 20 years, you know, but, but that's what we focus on. We identify these problems and we'll solve them. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, the Hemi Marsh at Lake Calumet. We were out there a couple weeks ago giving a tour to hopefully some fundraisers. Uh, and Walter Marsis, you know, who's a birder in this area, saw these, um, I'm gonna look up the name, I always forget the black. Uh, he, he was amazed when he saw them. He said he's been birding in Lake Calumet uh, for decades, and they're black scoters, and they're from up in Labrador, you know, up, you know, far, far Arctic area, that's where they spend the summer, so they're mi basically migrating through He's never seen them in Lake Calumet before. That's how important the lake is, you know, as bird habitat. And <clears throat> the birds are coming back because they're hardwired. You know, they've, they've been migrating through here thousands of years, and these are the descendants of birds that were migrating through here. And so the lake is not in the shape it could be, but if we get this all turned into a hemi marsh, you know, we should see a lot of other rare species in here besides black spurs. Okay. Um, but we don't want to just recreate habitat again just for the animals and plants and everything. You know, we want people involved. We have entire neighborhoods around Wolf Lake and Lake Calumet. Uh, it, at least Lake Calumet that have never seen the lake. And they live four blocks away or six blocks away. Uh, that's wrong. 
you know, I mean, this, this is a lake that for a hundred years, since people first settled in this area, in the 1830s or 40s, who were fishing in the lake, hunting in the lake, ice boating in the lake. I mean, I, I, I think, Cynthia, you probably have, I wouldn't doubt you have some photos in your Kelly River book. Well, mostly on the river, but. Yeah. yeah. But this, you know, people lived by the river when it was healthy. They lived by the lake when it was healthy. And now the port authorities put barbed wire fence around the whole thing. And, and for 30 or so years, people, whole generation of people, kids have grown up, don't even know there's a lake there anymore. So uh, Tom and you know a bunch of the downtown non-for-profits, uh, every year we do an Earth Day, Friends of the Parks, uh, Alliance for the Great Lakes, Open Lands. We work with Southeast Frontal Task Force and bring school kids out there. And we've had four Earth Day visits the Port Authority has allowed us to do. And you know, probably we've had 200 to 250 people that have brought out, most of whom have never seen the lake before. But you know, kids get binoculars and they're all looking at the bird habitat. And Walter Marsons is out here identifying birds for them. OK. So. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is to uh, since there's such a, a great river system here, is teach people how to use the river. You know, if Dan Plath lived on the Illinois side, he'd have a thousand people out there already, but, but there's no Dan Plath on the side. So, so open lands, the Chicago Park District, Forest Reserve District, we've all been working together for several years now, um, getting people out of the neighborhoods in the community and teaching them how to kayak and canoe. And, and it's never crossed their mind before that they could put a canoe, you know, on the little Calumet River uh, on the Illinois side. Okay, no. uh, but we do a little bit of training and then, you know, we take them out there. And we, and we, in the last three, four years, we've gotten a thousand people out on the water uh, canoeing, most of them for the first time in their lives. And what we're really hoping is that what I'd love to see would be for three or four of these kids, you know, when they get to be 18, 20 years old, be, become canoe guides. Because if you if you advertise, you know, that I'm offering a canoe trip on the Little Kelly River, if you advertise that in the metropolitan region where we have tens of thousands of kayakers now, you know, they love to come to a place they've never kayaked before. But, but they're not going to, you know, from Schaumburg or from Wheeling, or, you know, uh, Merrillville, you know, they're not going to come up to the little Kelly River on the south side of Chicago on their own. You know, they, they need to have a guide there. They need somebody who's going to give them the tour. And, <clears throat> you know, people, I mean, I know these paddlers, they'll pump down 50, 60 bucks a person for a three hour canoe trip. And if I'm one of these kids when I'm 21 years old and I advertise that during the summer and I do these canoe trips on the weekend, you make a lot of money during the summer doing that. And people are very willing to put the money. And they don't even have to provide canoes. I mean, people around the Chicago region will put a canoe kayak top of their car and just show up. So it's a really easy kind of a business to create. And that's what we're hoping to inspire some of these kids to do. And you know, then we'll see more and more of scenes like this. Uh, with bike trails, you know, we've, we've got a terrific trail system around Wolf Lake. Uh, I took out two Audubon members, uh, two ladies who were birders. Uh, this is right along the state line underneath the Nipsco lines, looking at the wetland to the west. Okay. And, uh, you know, and just, I mean, they're excited to, you know, they, they had never been uh, to the Wolf Lake trail system before. This is the first time they had a great time. Uh, but they never would have came on their own. You know, they need somebody to kind of to guide them. And I don't want to be a guide. I've got too many other projects and things to do. I, I'd love to have a, a 19 or 22 year old, you know, South Sider giving tours out here. Uh, and now there's such a big trail system. There's so much to see around Wolf Lake. Yeah, it's a business model, you know, if we can get some of our kids, young adults, students. And so, you know, as much as possible, we want to, you know, we want to get people out into the prairies. We have some of the highest quality prairies in the United States here in the Calumet region. Uh, and again, you know, so 
the Illinois, Indiana area is kind of famous nationwide for, for the citizen scientists that were that evolved over the last 30, 35 years that learned to identify prairie plants. Uh, the Audubon people, you know, members who really know how to identify birds. This is a really rich area to interpret and to show people that don't live in this area. So that kind of ecotourism is something that we're really hoping takes off. Um, this, this is at um, uh, Market Prairie uh, down in uh, 159th Street. One, and again, Market, Market Prairie, Burnham Prairie in the village of Burnham. Uh, which is great bird habitat, but prairies won't powder corn. Miller Woods, uh, these are astounding habitats, you know, that people from around the country, if it were advertised, you know, would come to see. And, okay. and then, you know, teaching adults and kids and teenagers how to take care of these habitats, because they do need interaction. When we had that natural landscape pre 1830, Native Americans were managing that landscape. It's kind of a combination of Native Americans and lightning, you know, that was setting off the prairie fires that were continually moving through this area, not allowing invasive species, which, you know, not that there were invasive species back then, but now that we have all kind of weedy species, if we don't have fire maintenance, if we don't have somebody out there to cut out the invasive shrubs. They'll, they'll just take over and destroy a natural area. So we're really back at that point of view where people really need to interact with nature, and that's critical for nature. These, these little remnant habitats aren't going to survive. So it's not just connectivity, it's people managing as well. Um, and home, you know, I've, I've taught a lot of homeowners how to do controlled burns. Uh, farmers, you know, have done controlled burns. They burn their fence lines all the time. Uh, this this is a technique that's you know very easy to learn. Uh, you got to learn to be smart, you know, and not overdo it and not over do do a burn that you can't handle. But it's pretty basic training. Uh, and it's and it's critical, you know. And, and we really don't do controlled burns uh, much anymore. We need a lot more of them. So this is the goal, you know, we're, we're trying to get a uh, younger generation especially, but everybody, to be really honest, all of us will be healthier if we have a habitat to, to share and, and live in. So this is looking inside of our heads, basically. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to be healthier. We're going to think better. You know, we're going to be more sustainable. We're going to live a healthier life. We're going to live longer. We're, we're going to live with much less stress. You know, if if we make these neural connections with this healthy living world outside of us, and, and if we become responsible for it being a healthy living world, even bit by bit, you know. We're not going to change the Calumet River overnight, but every little piece of habitat that's put along that shoreline, you know, every little bit of habitat you put in your backyard, you know, is helping to, to make us all healthier, not just the landscape but ourselves. Uh, and just the whole, you know, how many kids today, you know, have touched a dragonfly or had one land up there? Kids should be experiencing this all through the summer. Adults should too. I mean, we all should. It's one of the coolest feelings in the world when they, they grasp on your skin and they don't bite. You know, they're just they're real cool little critters. And you know, at some point we'll get back to a sustainable landscape in the future. Okay. Uh, and we'll enjoy it. And we'll be happier and healthier. So thank you very much. I have one. Uh, you were talking about again, getting the kids involved. We've seen the value of that when we're working with the Calumet Stewardship Initiative for a number of years and getting the kids out. I'm concerned about 
it happening with no, do you see it still happening even though funding has been decimated and things like that? Do so you still see the kids being involved and getting it out or are we losing that account? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a struggle because certainly not all the kids are out that should be out. But, uh, no, I, I think, you know, we never can depend on consistent funding. I think, you know, we, we just, we have to adjust, you know, it's, it's like any funding, is a stress of its own. It comes and goes, and so we have to respond creatively. And it's probably more volunteerism that's doing it. Um, and then, you know, then funding will reappear again under some political <coughs> structure, and it'll disappear again. But I think as individuals, you know, I mean, I, I the volunteer network that I see of people that are out there, you know, from running Boy Scout and Girl Scout groups to just. You know, the CSI, the Calumet Stewardship Initiative, is, is an astounding program. Um, you know, we, we need a lot more of those. We need teachers that, you know, right now teachers have a hard time developing an environmental curriculum that they're allowed to teach their kids because they've got all these other state and federal standards that they're supposed to meet all the time. So my wife was a sixth grade teacher, and it, it drives her crazy. She's She's not able to teach kids the way she'd like to teach them, which, you know, she, she's in a public school system, but it's almost like she wants to be more like a Montessori teacher, you know, let each kid kind of evolve at their own speed and, and you know, feed them things that they really get interested in. And if they're afraid of dragonflies, you know, then you push them towards butterflies or, you know, you have to adjust. And, and I, I think we've got the structure the potential, I guess, is what I would say of you know thousands of people in every community that can play a role. Uh, and when you're a volunteer with something like CSI, and you might put in a lot of hours. You know, even getting people to put in two hours a week or two hours a month that they had never done before is going to help some kids or help some leaders. Put it, put in. You know, some healthy landscaping in your front yard or your backyard might inspire a neighborhood to try it. So I think there's a lot of obvious ways, there's a lot of subtle ways, I think, that we just have to keep at it. Okay. Question, um, is there any um, organized effort to develop um, a guide program? You were talking about entrepreneurship. I think that would be so strange to people in this part of the country to do that, I mean, they do that other places, but is there anybody doing that's really um, organized? Yeah, there's, well, we're, we're applying for a grant now with four other agencies. Uh, we're, I, I'm forgetting my uh, Greenway's, uh, the other, my other Greenway staff person, Laura, is in the grant. She was just explaining to me a couple of days ago. Um, but what's, what's the group of young adults that works um, for a fairly low well wage. But AmeriCorps? AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps, yeah. Yeah, so there, there's like an AmeriCorps program, and one of the thoughts was through this AmeriCorps program to get young adults and see, you know, if there's 20 in the program, see if there are five or six that, that glom on to this idea of becoming guides. And if they are, you know, then that, that would be, we would train them, you know. And so I, I don't know if that'll work or not. You know, that's one attempt. Uh, I talk about it everywhere I go, and I, I'm just hoping somebody in the audience or some agency or college or whatever would say, I don't know, we'll do it. Uh, I don't think you can, uh, somebody's got to start it, and I, I don't think it's hard to do. And we've canoed the Calumet River system a lot. It is a really fun trip. You know, you put in at South Holland, at the high school up from 159th Street, and you come out at Face Point in Blue Island, that's a trip. Right. I've only managed to do once the trip on that the, the organized in in Gamble County Bath and it was fun to go and um, you know, I try to get other people interested in nobody goes just went. Right. But um always seemed like Cabello's missed an opportunity that that was the perfect place to have a launch in to right. set up an right. actual right. rental or sale yeah. of yeah. things for it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. They're a perfect spot. But we're just kind of lucky in Northwest Indiana to have Van Plan around. Mm -hmm. And um, you should try to get on his way over the summer. Um, 
And during our um, <coughs> wetlands festival uh, summer, we he loaned his canoes, and um, and of course we ran into a problem this year because uh, in Indiana you don't have to you know uh, have licenses or uh, for canoes. So and then we were using them in Illinois and. and uh, Probably Forest Preserve District did not like it, but um, but anyway, we are lucky because Dan is, is a great resource and um, and uh, just you know go to his website and and, and find out uh, what he's do, doing because he organizes a lot of things and he, and he runs out. The other thing I might suggest too is the extension services, uh, Purdue uh, uh, Northwest. Now, and um, and UIC, I've used both the extension services whenever. Now, they, their their folks are kind of limited. Some I go for you know they talk about trees and uh, but um, but you can get some. Uh, sometimes they come up handy for uh, whatever uh, whatever you're trying to get. I don't think for Wolf, just for Wolf Lake, I mean, exploring Wolf Lake, having a, uh, a guide available every Saturday, you know, for 12 weeks in the summer. Mm -hmm. I, I thought they would be busy. Well, yes. You've got to do a little bit of advertising. But, uh, and we do bike rides uh, uh, for those. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, somebody calls me out and they want, and so sometimes I just go out with three or four people. Yeah. And because of the the trail system that we have today, you can go just about everywhere in Wolf Lake, and even if you can't get real close, you can, you can at least talk about it. So, do you know what his website is again? Is it? It's NWIPA, I think, org. Northwest Indiana Paddlers Association. Uh, and and yeah, NWIPA. I said basically, I think that was yeah. it, Michael. You know, NWIPA looks like it's like That's good. <laughs> NWIPA. What is it? Dot org. Dan. Yeah. Platt. It's a D A N. Yeah. P L A T H. Oh, yeah. yeah, Platt. Uh, in regard to someone who does um, programs, that Eric Niegu, I don't exactly remember what his website is, but he does Calumet Outdoors. And I think he taps into a lot of the people who are experts throughout the area. Uh, I think he offers those maybe once a month or so. Yeah. So there are some people out there who are volunteering and trying to do this. And, and speaking of Dan Plath, uh, do you recall that very cold June day during the uh, centennial of the Burnham plan mm -hmm. when Dan Plath and about 20 other kayakers and canoers started from Marquette Park in the, no, Burnham Park, uh, at uh, about 30th Street, in Lake Michigan, and they went all the way to Michigan City, spent the night at Marquette Park in, in Gary. I mean, such things are possible, even on larger bodies of water, but the, that yeah. proved it, that proved that you could do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another thing that, you know, really has put Kelly Mudd on the national park, <laughs> is, you know, the, uh, Illinois and the Indiana Lakeshore of Lake Michigan is now designated National Recreational Trail. So we got it done before Wisconsin and Michigan did. Um, and, but that was important because you know it was a whole bunch of groups trying to do this whole circumferential route for, for sea kayaks for people that really know how to kayak in, in heavy water and heavy weather. Because it's about a, I think it's about a, depending if you follow the shoreline or cut across Green Bay. It's about anywhere between 500 and 800 miles. So, but there are people in the country that do those kind of things. And uh, we had to figure it out in Indiana, Illinois first, where you can camp overnight. Um, and so we got all the, uh, the marinas, you know, like the Hammond Port Authority Marina, they'll, they'll let the sea kayakers put a bedroll on, on the docks, you know, and they're, you know, they're secure, they're, they've got a, washer and mirror, they've got a laundry there, you know. And so most of the marinas let the sea kayakers on long distance trips do that. 
So Wisconsin and Michigan were waiting, you know, for Illinois and Indiana to figure it out. And now they're going to uh, adopt the National Water Trail. So we'll, we'll be on national maps. It's this enormous sea kayak and trail in the perimeter of Michigan. There already is one in Lake Superior. Uh, I know I know people that have done the route around Lake Superior. There's one in Lake Huron. So, and that's Calumet area. It's like right here. Questions? Okay.